This episode is dedicated to Dirk Wales, who was a guest on my show. Dirk recently passed away. He was featured on episode 11, Get Unhooked Prescription Drugs. Dirk Wales, filmmaker, author, Jack London's dog. Globally, Dirk is known for his educational training films for doctors in the area of anesthesia. His work saved countless lives, and the books he wrote entertained many. Dirk Wales' positive imprints are forever a part of humanity. Your positive, positive, positive imprint. 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 Stories are everywhere. People and their positive action inspire positive achievements. Your PI could mean the world to you. Get ready for your positive imprint. Hello, this is Catherine, your host of the podcast, Your Positive Imprint, the variety show featuring people all over the world whose positive achievements inspire positive thought and action. Exceptional people rising to the challenge. Music by the talented Chris Knoll. Check out his music and learn more about him at chrisknoll.com. C-H-R-I-S-N-O-L-E. Fabulous music and lots of new music, too. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram, Your Positive Imprint. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Check out my YouTube channel, Your Positive Imprint. Visit my website, yourpositiveimprint.com, where you can sign up for podcast updates and also follow this podcast. Under the play button is a subscribe button that will take you to easy links for some podcast platforms. You can also listen and follow my show from your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Amazon Music, including Alexa. Or, of course, listen from your favorite podcast platform. Please hit that subscribe or follow button now. This is a free podcast. Your positive imprint. What's your PI? Mm -hmm. Javier Robles is a professor at Rutgers University. He is a jurisprudence doctor graduate of Seton Hall Law School and a graduate of Rutgers University. One of his amazing positive imprints is his work on the establishment of a Center for Disability Research and Wellness at Rutgers University. His involvement as president of Disabled LLC, an organization providing support to persons with disabilities through self-empowerment and perseverance, helps him to better serve disabled persons. And oh my gosh, his positive imprint extends beyond the doors of universities to those of government and policymaking, including his efforts to change employment outcomes for people with disabilities. As a disabled resident himself of New Jersey, he also served as member of the Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel on Immigration. He's received countless recognitions and awards. Recently, with this pandemic, with COVID, he has been advocating for better treatment of New Jersey's disabled population. And he advocates for honeybees and their survival. He clearly has positive imprints that will inspire you to identify your own positive imprint and become active. Javier Robles, welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you, Catherine, and thank you for having me on the show. Oh, for goodness sakes. I It was so incredible to have met you just when I was searching for uh, beekeepers, and I came upon this profile of yours that is just ginormous. And your positive imprints extend, oh, for decades. And yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a tad old. <laughs> <laughs> you started, you. you just started so young with, yeah. with everything that happened within your own life and at Rutgers and trying to establish rights for disabled. Yeah, yeah. I started after my spinal cord injury when I was 16 years old and I was living in the city of Newark, New Jersey. And I used to go to the park and jog. And one day in April, I went to the park and I was jogging in one of the parks there. And I decided to climb this tree and I stepped on a branch and the branch broke and I landed on my back and spinal cord. So I acquired a C5 spinal cord injury from that. And from there, I basically had to learn how to live my life again as a person with a disability basically 
start over and go back to high school and really do that in a wheelchair and go back and you know, go through therapy and operations and all this other stuff and then decide what was I going to do with my life after that. Wow. So a tree branch. I am so sorry for that, but I am so incredibly happy for the fact that you have pushed forward, not just for yourself, but you have been laying a path for disabled. And it's not just New Jersey. It's beyond New Jersey's borders. And of course, globally, because when people read what others are doing, those positive imprints carry forward. So life goes beyond your borders with your positive imprints. And I certainly thank you for that. Thank you. You have this huge resume of goodness. So I'm going to let you take it and sure. decide where you'd like to begin. I'd like to start by saying I have hope, fortunately done um, quite a bit. None of that is possible without allies and family members and uh, a community and to some extent a nation that believes in the ability of people with disabilities to be independent and to move forward and to be part of society in the last, I would say, maybe 50 years where the rights of individuals with disabilities have come to the forefront and people with disabilities generally, which is a broad category. If you use the federal definition of disability, really to some extent coming to their own in terms of what they view as their rights to be treated like every other citizen in, in the United States, at least. We know that other countries still struggle as we do. But, and then the family and allies of those people who really have made a positive impact, whether it's people like Judy Human who worked uh, to pass the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act or other disability advocates. None of us did that by ourselves, but we did it with the help of others and because others believed in the better vision of what we can be as, as a country and as a people. So when I was first injured in, in 1983, there was no such thing as the Americans with Disabilities Act. There was no, none of these laws we have today. We, we had the Rehabilitation Act and Section 504, which to some extent protected students. We couldn't say, you need to make this place accessible. You need to put a power door here or make sure that we can access our classes. When I was starting at Rutgers University, we started this group called Rutgers Handicapable, which is probably not politically correct anymore. <laughs> That's the name we started with, and we started probably with five students and ended up with like close to 60 members because we advocated for access when we didn't have laws like the ADA to protect us. But it's true, no doubt about it. There's so much work to be done. I know personally of towns that understand that the ADA affects them and they should be complying with it. But when you go to some of these smaller towns or even some large towns, as a person in a wheelchair, you still can't even get in the door of a restaurant or of a bodega or of a grocery store. And this is problematic, right? Because when you're a person with a disability and you live in a certain neighborhood, you have a lot of other issues. You have transportation issues. You can't just like hop in your car and go to Target or you know some other big store and get what you want. You have to get what you want where you are because you don't have those resources. So we have so many challenges still left, even after the passing of the ADA and other laws that we're dealing with. And we're, to some extent, all dealing with these challenges in a vacuum. And why do I say that? Because, for example, when we started working on the COVID-19 issue in New Jersey was pretty much close to when this whole thing started. People with disabilities in our state didn't really have access to information. We didn't know um, a lot of things, but when we decided to get a bunch of people together and meet about this, and we met every other Friday consistently for months, close to, we're still meeting. And that gave all these people from diverse backgrounds with diverse disabilities, parents of children with disabilities, people with disabilities, advocates, siblings, it really gave us a space to sit down and say, what's wrong and how can we work on this issue? And because of that, we put together that report that I sent you 
with at least 24 recommendations at this point and growing, but that's only because we saw that our need for doing something right and making sure people were protected was greater than our individual needs as people with disabilities, as parents of kids with disabilities, as advocates. The thing about the disability community is that we're very splintered. People hear disability community, they're like, oh, that's just like one huge group, and it's not. Disabilities cuts across race, ethnicity, religion, you name it. Anybody can be disabled at any time. Statistically, by 2035, the amount of individuals with disabilities is expected to grow to 50, 50 by 56% when you count people who are elderly. We're looking at big numbers, but again, we're still splintered and we still need, we still need advocacy. And that's true. And one of the things that I want to bring up, because this is where the listeners and other people need to really understand is that it's not just what we are seeing with our eyes when we see a disabled person, such as, oh, you need someone to help open the door or or you need a ride to the store. It goes so far beyond that. And it Mm -hmm. goes to the secondary conditions that people don't see and don't know about. And I don't want to talk about the secondary conditions, Mm -hmm. but it's something that needs to be addressed at some point so that people do understand secondary conditions that are so imperative and important to understand so that it helps to understand why so much feasibility to funds is important, as well as other measures to help the disabled community, the population. So, and and I just wanted to throw that out, but let's go to your COVID initiative here. Not that it was an initiative because it, it just happened and there was nothing we could do. But you're doing something for the disabled population. So let's do talk about what this advocacy, how it has changed, because your pathway, your goals, obviously, have taken a crude adjustment with COVID. Yeah. New Jersey really is no different than any other state. What we saw and continue to see in this pandemic is that people with disabilities and their family members, which is a lot of people, one in five people in the United States, not counting their family, to some extent has some kind of disabilities. We are all going through a realization to some extent, and we did this in New Jersey, and I'm sure everyone else has, that our voices really weren't being heard, and that we really didn't have any input in terms of what the medical professionals think. And we thought, to some extent, at least, maybe I was a little ignorant, that we were past some of the the issues that have plagued us in the past, the issues of eugenics, the issues of individuals believing that the quality of life of an individual with a disability is less than the quality of life, what's considered quote unquote normal. And that when those two individuals present at a hospital with a similar condition, that it's more important sometimes, or depending on who's treating, to save that person that's considered normal. Because in the eyes of some people, people with disabilities, quality of life is not what they think it should be. So that's the one thing we dealt with to some extent right off the bat. And it it was a group of us, 23, 24 people who really worked on these issues. And we really had to meet and think about it and see what was happening in our state and other places. And read the news. If you read the news any given day from any newspaper anywhere in the U.S. or anywhere else, you would see that people with disabilities were having their legal rights discriminated against. They were denied ventilators in some cases because they have disabilities. Even with the laws that we have in place protecting us, saying someone with a disability has the rights, the same rights as anyone else, is that true? And if it's not true, why? How come we haven't move, you know, the needle a little bit forward more. So some of our recommendations, and there's about 24 of them right now, address a lot of these issues. It addresses the issues of people with disabilities, not only being empowered to make their own decisions, which is super important, but being at the table, right? When politicians, lawmakers, health professionals, and other individuals 
make decisions which affect us and our community and we're not at the table then how do you know that you made those decisions the right way when no one was asked you didn't ask a parent of someone with a disability what it would be like to put their child in a COVID unit and not having that parent being, a, being able to visit that child. There was no inclusion of us. So you'll see that a lot of our recommendations are around inclusion. Some of our recommendations are specific to specific disabilities. So individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, right? When you put a mask on, if they read your lips or if they're lip reading, they They don't know what you're saying because you have a mask on. Some of our recommendations are around that communication access for people who are blind. So, you know, a lot of specific recommendations, but the, I guess the optimal recommendation is that if you don't have people with disabilities at the table all the time, then you shouldn't be making decisions that are life and death to those people. If I was a business, I wish I had these people working for me because they are dedicated and they do it because they see that at the end of the day, it's that's it. We are all we have. The lawmakers, thank God, have been putting forward because we met we we're meeting with lawmakers pretty much every week and explaining the report and saying why we are pushing this and because we're doing that. These bills have come forth and we want more in terms of what lawmakers can do. One of the things that is super important, and I just wrote someone, another advocate about this, is the fact that people with disabilities depend on others to get out of bed, to go to work, to go to school, to be independent. A lot of us, not all of us. And these people who come into our homes, these personal care assistants or direct support providers or homemakers, whatever you want to call them in your particular state, These individuals are the difference between life and death to a lot of us. They're the difference between us getting a degree, us going to work, us getting to work, whatever it is. In the state of New Jersey and every other state, these people, which at least in our state are considered essential workers at this point, are paid what we would consider barely living wages. They're paid in our state probably at the max $12, you know, $13. New Jersey is one of those states that has a high cost of living, that might be good in another state where you have a low cost of living, but it's not good in New Jersey. In New Jersey, the individuals who work these jobs usually sometimes are individuals who are mainly women, individuals who may come from a class that's maybe not graduated from high school or immigrant class, that type of thing, but they're risking their lives to come out every day to get somebody out of bed and they can't afford personal protective equipment. So they're putting their life on the line, not to mention the fact that because they aren't paid that they have to take other people on as consumers or people they work with. So that means that one of these individuals goes to three or four homes a week, a day, just to make ends meet. And they're the difference between someone being in a nursing home and not. In our state, which is New Jersey, you can make $18, $20 an hour working for Amazon or UPS or FedEx. And there's a lot of those jobs. So the question is, why would someone want to work for someone with a disability, travel in their own car, buy their own PPE, when they can work someone else, somewhere else? So we're looking at a, at a time bomb in the United States, not just New Jersey, as our population ages, where you're, you're not gonna be able to find people to help people out of bed, whether it's people with disabilities or the elderly, whomever. That's one of the things we've been pushing hard with our lawmakers that we need to increase the wages of you know, these essential workers. The, recommend, the 24 recommendations we're making are all going towards the governor, towards the legislature, towards the state's lawmakers, as well as individuals with disabilities themselves and advocates and other organizations. You know, when our recommendations were released, we've had other organizations in the state contact us saying that they want to work with us to move some of these along. Legislation regarding access to PPE, legislation which which regards access to food. So one of the things that we found really quickly was that we weren't set up in the state, and I'm sure other states will find the same thing, 
to have people who receive government benefits in our state, we call them EBT cards, which are those like plastic credit cards that people who are on benefits get. And you take those cards to the supermarket and you get food. That's the normal course of business. But we weren't set up for that. So when people tried to use those cards on online shopping to get their food, they couldn't do it because it wasn't something that the state had thought about. So one of the initial things we pushed for, you know, at the Department of Human Services was to make sure that these things were happening. A lot of advocates in the state of New Jersey, independent living centers, other advocates pushed for this. Luckily, we got that sort of done right away. But it's things like this that you normally don't think about. When I say that COVID-19 really exposed a lot of cracks in our system, and not just for people with disabilities, for the elderly, for people who receive benefits, for mothers, across the board. So some of the other recommendations, like one of the recommendations that was put forth this just this week, was to set up a, a committee of individuals with disabilities at the government level to work on these issues for the future. It's great that our committee got together. We had a lot of great people, but we shouldn't have to do that next time. Government should have a standing committee of people with disabilities and their families and advocates on an ongoing basis that are either appointed by the lawmakers or the governor or this committee itself to work on these issues, to work on issues of employment and education and access to personal care services. And I think New Jersey and other states would be well to really think about something like that, as opposed to our lawmakers just coming up with laws and not consulting anyone. Sure. So how do you get this beyond the borders of New Jersey and going to the national level? So that all states, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm sure that there are other people in other states that are working on legislation within their own states. But when you're talking COVID, I would think that there would have been measures put in place already at the national level. But apparently, I too Mm -hmm. am ignorant with that and uninformed. So how do you get this across the borders? That is... The question, right? We really need, and and I am hoping that with a a new administration, we really need a national focus on what we saw. And what we saw was horrible. You know, what I saw every morning at, at least in New Jersey, we were, New, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, we were the first few states to really get hit by this. And what we saw, body bags coming out of nursing homes on a daily basis and people in freezers or out of freezers or whatever it was. It was like a horror show. Just not acceptable for one of the richest nations in the world. It's not acceptable to do that to the elderly, to people with disabilities, to people with mental health conditions. So how do we get across what we saw and make things better? I think we need a unified voice in the disability community, first of all. We have a lot of great advocates out there, but we really need to come together and, again, put our individual differences aside, which could be advocating for our own issues. But we saw one thing, and we keep talking about this, our committee talks about this, and that is that one of the main issues that we all have is the fact that if we're not together and we're not organized as a group, we're going to continue to see what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a lot of people dying, a lot of people not being able to access services. It, it's hard. It's a hard lesson to learn. We need more programs like yours to get the word out. We need more in terms of the federal level programs, which work for people with disabilities to really take these issues on and not be fearful. Sure. And I think that's one of the keys is to not be fearful, but also people, like I say, People think that because we have the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, people think that it's all said and done and and it's all good. And it's not. And I am certainly learning that as I meet more and more people who are disabled or even not disabled, but are advocates to that. So there's there is work to be done. And like I say, it's 2021 and it's unnerving to know that there's not enough in place for citizens because yeah yes yeah and and we're we are lucky in new jersey we do have a governor that has been pushing 
certain things. We have lawmakers, obviously, who care about the recommendations. That's not the same thing in other states. It's not the same thing in states where poverty is an issue. Health care is not the same in every state. So a lot right. of states it's... have Medicaid. So Medicaid depends on what your state decided to do. If your state doesn't think that's an important thing to work on, then a lot of people with disabilities and their elderly don't get services. And my state is a very impoverished state, and we are a very poor state over here in New Mexico. Yeah, and that's, I don't want to get into the whole national argument, but I, I know a lot of states don't want the national government. They don't want national help. They don't, and I don't, to some extent, understand that. When we look around America and the United States and we compare ourselves to rising countries like other European countries, we need the national government to step in and help these states. We need them to step in and give health care to people. We need them to feed these young kids who go to school without food. We have enough studies, medicals, and, other, and otherwise to say, if you send a young kid to, to school without breakfast every morning, their brain is not going to develop appropriately. And while you might not think that's going to be an issue down the line, it is because these are going to be the citizens of America in 20 years or, you know, 15 years. And don't we want American citizens to be the best and the brightest to compete with other countries for jobs and to compete on a level playing field? So if our government can help us reach that, then who can? If our states are unwilling, where do we move from here? And yes. I know that's a conversation that people have been having for a while, but... Sure. You know, and this is something I tell my students all the time. And a lot of us believe that there's people who do well, who do better than others because they're white or because they're black or because they get privileges here and there. Mm -hmm. But the reality statistically speaking, is that it's not always a question of race. It's usually a question of class, right? So those people that are poor and those people that are poor in Appalachia and have been poor for hundreds of years, and those people that are poor in Louisiana and New Mexico and New Jersey, lots of times they're poor whites, lots of times they're poor blacks. And a lot of times they usually fight against their own interests because they're told that other people are getting more than they are. And that's not the reality. The reality is that in the United States, we don't see a huge rise of the middle class, right? The middle class is not getting any bigger. As a matter of fact, it's shrinking. It is. And the only rise nationally is the one in 2%. They've done exponentially well during COVID-19 where other people have lost jobs, will lose their house once these band-aids are pulled off. So it's super difficult and it's hard for people to understand that, look, just because you're white or I'm black or Puerto Rican or Latino, we're in the same boat. Believe it or not, me and you in Appalachia are in the same boat. You may be worse off because you don't have health care but you don't have health care because your particular state chose not to have those Medicaid buy-ins or chose to put the money somewhere else. But in, in the understanding that they receive is you don't have health care because someone who's Latino in New Jersey took that money from you and has health care. So these are problems that are ongoing and unless we address them and speak about them and put them in the open, it's going to, going to continue to be the same message to everyone, but that's not the reality. That person didn't do that to you. And it frustrates me, obviously, because we could be a better country. We could be something better. And I think that's where governments need to look at really putting out a way to educate people the mm -hmm. skill of critical thinking. Critical thinking is going by the wayside, and that's not a good thing because that's mm -hmm. where we do learn to make decisions based on fact and research. So this brings us now to a, a hopefully a positive ending mm -hmm. to all of this. What do you see as the future for your own advocacy? Will it change? Is your path going to mm -hmm. hopefully change in a different direction? 
I face reality every day. I know that I'm old. I know that I'm getting older. And I know You're that- You're not old. <laughs> I know that statistically I've outlived my statistical life insurance measure or whatever they call it. And my goal is for young people with disabilities, young people of color, young people from wherever to take a lot of these issues on. They're not going away. When I go away or other advocates go away or pass away or whatever, whether it's from whatever it is, we need young people to realize that the world around them, just because there's laws in place or just because someone tells them that everything's okay, everything's not okay. If you realistically do the research, if you take the time to look around you and talk to people, which I think it's highly important. I think what you're doing is highly important, talking to people. We've forgotten the art of talking and that has been a detriment to not just this country, but a lot of other countries. We forgot that just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean that I can't talk to you. Just because you're not in the same party I am, just because you're not the same color I am, doesn't mean that we can't talk to each other. Because if we don't, we're just going to continue on this road for a long time. Talk to each other, be civil. I can agree with a lot of things that people from the other party agree on, because I think some of those things are good. I can't agree with everything. And they, if they stop to think, they could probably agree with a lot of things that I have to think about or say, but we're not talking to each other. We're talking across each other. We're not listening, which is the other important part is to listen. I, I wish I could tell people who, especially on TV, whether they're on CNN or Fox or wherever they are, I wish I could just tell them sometimes, just shut up and listen to that person. Listen to the person you're interviewing. Just be quiet for a second because they're going to tell you something that's important to them. And it may not have anything to do with politics. It might have something to do with them feeding their kids. It might have something to do with them getting their kids to school who may have a disability and all of a sudden their child is at home. They're not getting any education because of COVID-19 and they don't know what to do. But yeah, they're Republican. Oh yeah, they're Democrat. But who cares where they come from? They have the same issue that you do. But I think if we do more of that, we can move at least a little bit. I thank you so much for those inspirational words, for sure. Absolutely. And I hope that we do start to see a turnaround. And I'm very positive because we have people that have learned so much this last year so that we can put measures in place to help with the healing process before that Band-Aid does come off. Because when that yeah. Band-Aid does come off, it's going to be... A, it's going to hurt. It's, yeah. Yes, it is. But I hope that it will bring a more unity and, and not division. So yeah. we, we certainly yeah. hope for that. And your advocacy certainly is helping with everything nationally. And I certainly look forward to seeing your work cross those borders of New Jersey. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, and then, go ahead. Yeah, and I, and 2020 was obviously to some extent, the worst year that I can ever remember. But to some extent, it was the most eye-opening year that I can ever remember. And that's good. I think we lived for a long time in this fantasy world that everything was okay. But what we saw on the streets every day with people getting killed, with shootings, with all this, the reality was that everything wasn't okay. And it really took 2020 to open our eyes a lot of our eyes to what was really happening. And I, I think a lot of people deserve credit, including those young white people who came out and said, I don't care what color you are, it's not right that this is happening. Those Christians that came out and said the same thing. But a lot of credit needs to go where it needs to go. And it's because people finally said, that's it. We know what's happening. We can see it. It was bad, but it was to some extent good. What would you say to people out there that, that you are trying to reach so that you feel like your advocacy is moving forward and that it's not stagnating? I guess I would say, first of all, don't give up. Don't give up on what you want to achieve. Don't think things are over just because things are bad. Life is cyclical, so things will get better would be number one. And I guess number two is believe in what you're doing, believe in whatever your cause, whether it's disability rights or women's rights or 
black rights or whatever it is, believe in what you're doing and just slowly move forward. There's been lots of times in my life where it's just gotten so difficult that you just want to quit and you want to just say, I can't do this or this is too hard, but just go slow, go a little bit at a time. Don't try to do it all at once and move forward. As long as you're moving forward, you're making progress, whether that's talking to one person and getting across to that one person who you thought maybe wasn't reachable or whether it's talking to your lawmaker and getting legislation passed that you think is important for people that you're advocating for. Just keep moving forward. Don't, Don't stop. And I know that's difficult. I know it's difficult when you're hungry or difficult when you're being oppressed or difficult when, you know, you can't get out of bed because your personal care assistant didn't show up this morning. In the end, I think it'll be worth it. Well, Javier Robles, you are so inspirational and you're very positive and you have set such wonderful, not just advocacy, you're not just advocating, you're actually out there and you're setting standards and you're setting those values for the citizens to see, but also for our lawmakers to really see and view what is important in legislation when it comes to the disabled. And the other I just want to say is that you, for so many years, have been involved with the issues of those that are disabled. But truly, as you said, people with disabilities cross that line of race, ethnicity, religion, sex. So you're advocating for a ginormous population of people. And I so thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to you know, talk to your audience. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So this ends part one with Javier Robles. And part two will begin with Honeybees and his beekeeping. Your positive imprint. What's your PI? Please don't forget to hit that subscribe or follow button on your podcast platform now. My website, yourpositiveimprint.com. And again, you can listen from any podcast platform. Your Positive Imprint. What's your PI?